we had a very good first session i'm i'm really delighted we started off with very wise words from ravi and uh, a welcoming speech from haris gunawan so now on to our technical part of this session which we have two two sessions session 1 is basically focusing on the biophysical attributes which are soil climate water and greenhouse gas emissions and without going in much detail because we'll have a discussion session where we can touch upon these topics i would like to introduce our first speaker which is professor mark reed he is professor of socio technical innovation at newcastle university he's joining us from uk his research is focused on enhancing the sustainability and resilience of peatlands and agri food ecosystems so here he will be talking about identifying core biophysical criteria and indicators for peatland monitoring and research so without further ado the floor is yours professor mark reed thank you very much indeed it's a pleasure to be with you all so as you are all aware research has shown that protecting restoring and sustainably managing our peatlands can play an important role in combating climate change but the task of creating national peatland policy is far from simple benefits for the climate may come at the expense of benefits already enjoyed by local communities and interventions that work in one location may have disastrous consequences when applied in a one size fits all approach now i think it's easy to criticize policy makers when things go wrong but i think researchers need to take some of the blame The reason I say this is that researchers have a nasty habit of making policy recommendations from single studies. I know that I've been guilty of this myself when my research funder has told me to make a policy brief at the end of my project. I've always tried my best to come up with something useful that could be done in policy or practice on the basis of my research. But what happens when another researcher comes along with contradictory findings and makes opposing recommendations to the very people I just briefed? Well, maybe one of us got the wrong answer, or perhaps we actually measured different things in different ways, or perhaps differences between our study sites might account for the apparent contradiction. Clearly this is no way to make good policy and the civil servants among us know of course that their task is to synthesize evidence from a patchwork of multiple studies and sites rather than relying on single studies no matter how persuasive the evidence of that one study might be but there is a problem The majority of systematic reviews are unable to find enough high quality evidence that can be synthesized because everyone is measuring different things. If two groups measure the same thing, say water table depth, they may measure it in very different ways using very different methods, which means we still can't synthesize their data. Even if they measure the same thing in the same way the two groups might present their data in ways that prevent synthesis for example omitting crucial contextual details like the location or the altitude at which the data was collected so i don't know if i'm comparing like with like as a result it can often be difficult to correct to directly compare peatland policy options because researchers have evaluated each policy option in different ways for example whether a policy option enhances biodiversity or mitigates climate change it's also difficult to combine insights from different studies about the same issue when studies measure different indicators in different ways or do not fully or consistently report their data data that can't be used is i would suggest the ultimate fieldwork fail if you want a good laugh have a look at the fieldwork fail hashtag uh, and book uh, which sadly features me running around a ugandan forest semi naked more seriously though the upshot of all this is that many decisions in policy and practice are informed by the results of individual studies which are often later contradicted by the findings of subsequent research Now a large group of us are currently tackling this through a collaboration with the International Tropical Peatland Center and input from around 50 researchers from every major tropical peatland in the world. 
Our goal is ambitious. We want to change the way peatland data is collected and reported around the world so that more and more people collect data on the same variables in ways that can be synthesized. Ultimately, the goal is to facilitate meta-analysis that can enable more evidence-based policy and practice. I'm coordinating a team with Gav Stewart and Dylan Young from the Universities of Newcastle and Leeds and the Global Peatlands Initiative to standardize the collection of environmental data so it can be combined from multiple studies and sites to better inform policy and practice. After trialing the process in UK peatlands, we've now replicated it for tropical peatlands and hope to extend the approach to other peatlands around the world in future. A number of those present here on the webinar met in Egypt, Indonesia earlier, this, uh, earlier, earlier last year to identify the key indicators that should be measured in tropical peatlands. This year then, we supplemented these variables and went through a prioritization process with the tropical peatland research community to identify the most important indicators or core outcome measures, as we're calling them, that the majority of experts agree need to be measured if we want to understand the health of our tropical peatlands. The analysis of our tropical data will be completed next week, and I can send that to anyone who's interested. But to give you a feel for what this might look like, here are the most important climatic indicators that were prioritised for the measurement, for measurement in the UK, what we call in this approach the climate core outcome set. Looking at the first five rows in the list here, you can, oh, it's not it's the first five, the first five uh, that, are, that are rated green um, on the right hand side of the screen. You can see that there is strong agreement that we need to measure rate of peat accumulation, it's a hard word to say, uh, peatland extent and peat composition. Great. Uh, so far, so good. These will be in the core set of key indicators we will recommend for measurement in the UK. However, there's less agreement over the importance of measuring, say, peat buildup behind dams or dust losses. That doesn't mean that those indicators shouldn't ever be measured. If they're important for your particular study, then of course you should prioritize them, but you will do so in the knowledge that there may be few others measuring these. And as a result, there is less likelihood that your data may be used in future meta-analysis to inform wider policy and practice. The next step is to move to methods and we're identifying reliable methods that could be used to collect data for each of the priority indicators, ranging from highly accurate but expensive and time consuming methods that are the domain of researchers to methods that can be used by non-researchers and those with limited resources. As Ravi said earlier on, this is really important if we want to engage communities in citizen science, or if we want to enable practitioners and other organizations with limited resources to collect reliable data on the key variables that have been prioritized. Before I finish, I'd like to do a quick pitch for the Global Peatlands Initiative Research Working Group. We'll be launching a call for new members in the next few weeks. So give me your email address. Um, if Tanya can put this into the chat for us now, then you can click on the link and uh, complete the survey. Uh, it's just uh, one field, so very quick. Um, uh, and you'll get also access to uh, a training program, which is open to all peatland researchers, starting with a session in December on writing more competitive funding bids. Uh, you'll get uh, a research agenda that we've put together with key unanswered people and research questions and a list of potential funders and a report detailing the 50 most recent people and research projects that have been funded are under review or are in development around the world and of course if you have your own projects you want to add to that email me i would love to add that to the list so uh, get in touch um, by giving me a list, uh, by giving me your email address, and uh, and that is a great way of staying in touch with this work. Uh, and I will also be updating this group with the work that we're doing on these core outcome sets um, or key indicators. So finally, to conclude, 
I think if we're serious about evidence-based policy and practice, initiatives like this are of crucial importance. This initiative won't instantly enable us to harmonize data to create accurate global peatlands maps, although I'd love it if it could. <laughs> it's not gonna provide evidence synthesis to support the next decision that you need to make, but we must stop and think about how we collect and report data now, if we want the data we collect to enable more evidence-based policy and practice in years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Reed. That was bang on time. I'm really impressed. I, I, I hope uh, other speakers will also follow suit. And thank you for sharing all the interesting ideas. And I know you have done this kind of exercise so we all can learn from there. So moving on to our next speaker of this session, uh, we have uh, Dr. Chris, Crystal Hargulash. She is a senior scientist with C4's Climate Change, Energy and Low Carbon Development Group. Crystal has more than 15 years of experience conducting research on climate change mitigation in tropical countries, including Indonesia, Peru, Costa Rica. Uh, she studies biogeochemical impacts of forest degradation and land use changes on greenhouse gas fluxes and how this affects the carbon stocks. And today she will be sharing her knowledge on peatlands, particularly talking about how do we monitor tropical peatland greenhouse gas emissions and whether our current knowledge is sufficient what can we do? How can we use it? So uh, more details from Crystal. Over to you, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you, Rupesh, for the introduction and good day, everyone. I'm very pleased to participate in this webinar on criteria and indicators for tropical peatland restoration. In my talk, I will present our state of knowledge on peat greenhouse gases emissions from land use and land use change in the tropics and their controls, and will underline some critical gaps. So tropical peatlands uh, play a prominent role as a global carbon pool with an estimated worldwide carbon stock of 350 gigatons of carbon in the soil, which excludes large uh, stocks in the vegetation, especially in forests. Pristine peat swamp forests of Indonesia store 200 tons of carbon per hectare in the phytomass and about twice as much per meter of peat. These uh, tremendous amounts of, of carbon stored in soils result from higher litre inputs than decay losses in anoxic conditions over the long term. Um, emissions of greenhouse gases from the pit arise from a range of activities and microbiological processes, which vary according to vegetation cover and environmental dynamics. Pit carbon dioxide emissions originate from net pit decomposition loss, called on-site uh, CO2 emissions in the IPCC guidelines. This loss is the balance between carbon entering the pit through litter fall and root mortality and carbon exiting by microbial decomposition of uh, the organic matter, which is also called soil heterotrophic respiration. CO2 is also lost via dissolved carbon exports and through fires. Nitrous oxide emissions stem from peat decomposition and from nitrogen application in fertilized systems. Finally, methane emissions form from soils uh, through micro microbial decomposition and fires, uh, but also from ditches. So this figure shows uh, the complexity of the mechanisms underlying peat greenhouse gases emissions and the efforts that are needed to account for all of them. I will now present some results for Southeast Asia based on our contribution to the 2013 IPCC guidelines and additional research. In the region, pristine peat swamp forests act on average as a small greenhouse gas sink with larger on-site CO2 uptakes than accumulated losses from nitrous oxide 
and methane emissions, and DOC exports. The average budget uh, of greenhouse gases may be very different in regions of the Amazon basin, where we and others um, measured very large emissions of methane, with a budget therefore uh, highly dominated by this greenhouse gas, as you can see uh, in the bottom figure. After drainage and conversion, peat soils become very large sources of greenhouse gases, especially in land uses such as acacia plantations or annual crop plants, including rice fields. The greenhouse gas budget is dominated by CO2, except in shallow drain systems such as sago palm plantations. But our knowledge on the scale of greenhouse gas emissions from tropical peat soils remains incomplete and, pre and preliminary. For instance, the nitrous oxide emission factors of the IPCC used for compiling the greenhouse gas budgets in my former slide likely underestimate substantially actual emission rates from peat decomposition. These factors were based on very limited N2O flux data of low magnitude, while large emission rates have been recorded since then. As you can see on this figure, the contribution of N2O to peat greenhouse gas budget is 2% using uh, IPCC emission factors, whereas when we consider instead the large emissions from peat decomposition observed in oil palm plantations, um, in Indonesia, this contribution goes up to 12 to 15 percent. Furthermore, um, emissions in degraded lands that are undrained also prove to be substantial. Uh, we measured peat greenhouse gas fluxes in undrained primary and secondary forests in Indonesia and found uh, peat greenhouse gas budgets one order of magnitude larger in secondary forests than in primary forest. Results show that secondary forests emitted much more um, CO2, but also nitrous oxide than primary forests. In the Peruvian Amazon, we looked at how sustainable forest management affected peat greenhouse gas fluxes and found peat greenhouse gases emissions in highly degraded conditions, twice the emission measured in pristine conditions. And what happens after we wait in a drain site? As you can see on the right side of the figure, the pit remains a source of greenhouse gas, according to assumptions, as we currently lack uh, data. On-site CO2 emissions and nitrous oxide emissions were assumed to be zero by the IPCC, while dissolved carbon exports and methane emissions were assumed to be similar to levels in pristine conditions. And what happens after restoration? There are no data and no assessment either, as emissions will highly depend on the type of restoration that is implemented. We need proxies for a cost-efficient mo monitoring of different types of activities conducted in pitlands. These proxies are typically derived from uh, process-based modeling or more empirical approaches. In both cases, solid long-term and consistent data sets are required. As an example, we can cite the soil CN ratio, which, which is used to scale nitrous oxide emissions from drained forest histosols um, to national levels in Sweden. Notwithstanding, identifying generic proxies is difficult as key controls of greenhouse gas fluxes uh, may vary among land uses and uh, drainage practices. For instance, while methane fluxes are chiefly controlled by the water table labeled in undrained systems, this is not the case in drained land uses. Furthermore, Different processes are governed by different controls. 
So for monitoring on-site peak CO2 emissions, which result from microbial decomposition and plant-related processes, it is not straightforward to determine which proxies would be the most suitable. For this emission factor, which is critical as it contributes importantly to peak greenhouse gas budgets, the best option for identifying proxies would be to conduct process-based modeling. Finally, another difficulty in defining ad adequate proxies arises from the lack of data because some key controls of greenhouse gases are seldom reported, such as, for instance, uh, mineral nitrogen contents and dynamics. I would like to finalize my presentation with some take home messages. We need more data on peak greenhouse gas emissions and their controlling factors for the tropics. Notably, we need to conduct research to understand uh, the rates before and after reweighting and restoration. We also need more research outside of Southeast Asia. We need good quality data. As we noted this recent years, a tendency towards short-term experiments with low measurement frequency. Finally, we need to process-based model peak greenhouse gas fluxes in the tropics for enhanced understanding of the complex and interactive processes and adequate identification of easily measurable and reliable proxies. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Crystal. That was also exactly on time so i'm very pleased thank you so much for providing all this detailed nuances when we are studying or conducting research in peatlands and trying to identify when or how they work as sinks or sources so these are very important topics to, to keep in mind particularly when we are looking at the criteria indicator approaches and we will have i think very rich discussion at the end so i would not spend much time here and i will go directly to our next speaker i'll introduce professor gusti ansari he is a professor and chair of the master's program of environment soil science and soil science department at tanjungpura university indonesia he is an expert in tropical peatland um, ecosystems and has published a large number of scientific publications related to these unique ecosystems and broadly on climate change issues. Today he will be sharing his uh, insights uh, and uh, he will be talking about a framework for restoring degraded tropical peat swamp forests. So the floor is yours, Professor Gustin. Sorry. Thank you very much, Rupesh. Uh, good afternoon and good morning for everybody. Uh, uh, I'm glad to be here to give this presentation. This presentation. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Let me share my screen. Is it okay now, my screen? Yes, perfect. Go ahead. So the title of my presentation is "Change to be a Framework for Restoring the Great Tropical Peat Swamp Forest." Okay. So I would like to emphasize tropical peat swamp forest is a very unique because it's a forest. So just found in South Asia, Congo, and Amazon. Yeah. So the size may be around 38 until 40 million hectares. But in Indonesia, it's the largest tropical peat swamp forest in Southeast Asia. So covering maybe around the latest data, by the government on the 13.4 million hectares. Uh, previously, we, we might have until 20 million hectares of tropical, uh, tropical peat swamp forest occurring in Sumatra, Kalimantan, and uh, Papua. So the interesting thing, the, both the non-tropical and tropical peat, peatland ecosystem, contain uh, black water, but in the tropical peat forest, the black water uh, contain a lot of uh, aquatic fauna, in particular a lot of uh, uh, fish species. Uh, organic matters of woody vegetation compared to the sphagnum, veget uh, sphagnum uh, biomass in the non-tropical peat 
and vegetation communities adapting to inundation and also poor soil uh, fertility. So as you know, that main function of this tropical peat swamp forest is our water storage because it's considered as wetlands and also as critical already uh, described as a carbon sink. And also important here, provision of timber and other economic goods. Uh, and also habitat for wildlife is the uh, most important, is like the orangutan. Also, so you can see this uh, orangutan on the degraded uh, tropical peat swamp forest in Ketapang because of land use changes. Yeah. Uh, so this destroy their habitat and also change the peat properties, also change, uh, change our peat hydrology and also degrees of degradation of tropical peat swamp forest is really dependent on the resource extractive regime. But as you know, that most of our tropical peat swamp forest is acceptably or continuously locked uh, all over Indonesia. So the, the underlying cause of the peat degradation in Indonesia, first of all, of course, deforestation, uh, for different purposes, from timber or also to, uh, to convert the land, uh, the forest into agriculture, of uh, drainage, and also planting tropical peat with introduced plant species in agriculture like uh, oil palm, macassia, or other, other crops. So these are uh, simple degrees of uh, degradation. This is make, uh, it's not really good indicator maybe, but just enough. Yeah. So selected timber removal without drainage, maybe the degree is low, but Crystal said it's a very quite high uh, emission. Selected timber removal with manual and shallow drainage, maybe medium or intermediate. Clear cutting, deep drainage, and significant land cover change into shrub agriculture uses and planted monocultures with high uh, degra degradation degrees. So this is a very qualitative uh, 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 statement. So what are the restoration option? Restoration option of degraded uh, peat are not easy and also can be not cheap, but should be manageable or affordable. I agree with uh, uh, Professor Ravi. So, that's why we need to determine the restoration priority. In fact, the objective of restoration is to facilitate tropical peat forest as a super organism to refurbish both economic and tropical uh, ecological function. So for example, this is a restoration option. The first priority maybe on undrained log of a secondary peat swamp forest, as you know why I, I mentioned under and log of secondary peat swamp forest. Most uh, all of tropical forest in Indonesia, I would I would say, uh, is already locked. Yeah. So if uh, in log of uh, secondary peat swamp forest, we can hope to do natural vegetation regeneration and planting enrichment if possible. And the second priority maybe drain log log of secondary peat swamp forest. And of course, because there is drainage, we need to do canal blocking or refilling. And also we should promote natural vegetation regeneration. And also we do uh, some planting enrichment. Most difficult, the deforested pit and other drain pit. So we need construction to do some construction of hydrological engineering. So we need to uh, have a water table monitoring, replanting native species. Also, if in particular on protected peat, yeah. it's very difficult to replanting trees on degraded uh, peatland in Indonesia because we cannot find enough uh, material, seed material. So these are I adopt from FAO restoration framework. So for example, uh, restoration on drain log uh, of tropical peat forest. We need to define the objective. For example, here to restore a high ground water table and to facilitate natural regeneration processes. So, what of course we need to have a mean of activities or management. We need to do the mapping. We need to assess the water balance. We need to have the hydrological construction plan. 
and we do vegetation analysis and also we can including a planting arrangement and then we need to evaluate also what 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 are those for example measurement of the ground over the table maybe twice a year or maybe more or maybe every week it depends on the context yeah uh, we need to measure soil moisture maybe during the dry and uh, wet season and of course we need to uh, measure subsidence rates maybe once a year and analyze analysis of natural vegetation regeneration maybe once a year or once every five years or other things uh, maybe measurement of carbon stock and so on and of course very important to have the validation we need to have the online availability of reporting and supplement data in order to encourage uh, public uh, access. This for example is uh, the forest because it belongs to the state, okay? Okay, this is my last slide. The, in conclusion, so restoration of the graded pit is a very long term program, can be more than 10 years. And restoration programs consist of, yeah, specific objective, means of detailed activities, evaluation, indicators and tool, reporting, means of validation. I think that's all my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I go give back to you, Rufes. Thank you, Pagusti. Uh, thank you for finishing your uh, presentation also a little bit before time. So I'm, I'm very thankful for all the speakers of this session. And uh, now we have some time left for discussion. What I, I was planning on doing is to <clears throat> just pose a couple of questions myself to sort of get the discussion get started. And then we can also revisit some of the questions that uh, our audience have asked. And then uh, depending on time, you can address that. So I'm sort of uh, trying to give a couple of, well, uh, I would say questions in a general rather than focusing in it to particular speaker but as a summary, summary of this session. And please feel free to uh, answer, respond to my thoughts uh, as uh, you think uh, that you can answer it. So what we, we heard today was kind of a, a broad um, a range of topics, which are obviously coming from um, biophysical aspects, but the idea was, uh, sorry, I had to, sorry, I had a timer set. So you finished before. So uh, the, the broad set of criteria and indicators and how we can fit this data that we have uh, collected, that we have uh, into these kind of criteria and indicators. So uh, Professor Reed shared how this uh, idea of um, having good data um, may not help in synthesizing because somewhere there is a differences in measurement, somewhere uh, the data is not reported. So how do you reconcile that? What are the mechanism and how we go about it? And then Crystal showed in her presentation uh, that can we use proxies like modeling as one of the approach to fill up those gaps? And then Professor Gusti Ansari shared how the restoration, when we're talking about peatland restoration, uh, it's a long-term exercise and it needs to, to be based on specific objectives, which are followed with good practice, monitoring and validation. So this was a very, very good kind of a summary of, of these uh, topics. Uh, and you share a lot of information. My question is directly, how do you go about doing it in terms of when you have those very many approaches of data collection, uh, reporting and all that, how do you distill it into simple people-centric criteria and indicators? And I'm going back uh, to what Ravi mentioned, that people should be the focus. People who are implementing it, it has to be simple. And the idea of having good enough approaches. So how do you go about it in practical sense? Anyone? Crystal, Professor Reed, Professor Gustin, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, ultimately, I think there are two approaches to this. There is a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. I think both are equally valid. Um, so the initiative that uh, my colleagues and I have been working on is uh, a top-down approach to this, that we start with the science. What is the full range of possible criteria and indicators available that are known to science? Uh, can we then, uh, using scientific expertise, 
uh, get this to a priority list of ones which we know are accurate uh, and reliable uh, and, and necessary to, to measure. Uh, and then the second stage is that we then look at methods for measuring each of those. And we're looking now um, for the scientific, the scientific methods, which will be highly accurate, but perhaps time consuming and expensive, through to perhaps proxy method, methods that could be used by citizen scientists and practitioners. Uh, and we then have a menu of different methods accessible to different people for each of those indicators. The bottom-up approach uh, suggests starting with the communities themselves and asking the question, how do you know if a peatland is healthy or unhealthy, degraded, restored? Um, and from my own experience of doing this um, in various different contexts, you get incredible information from these people, which overlaps significantly with the scientific understanding. And now you have a subset of the scientific indicators that we know, that we also know are currently already understood and measured by local communities. Uh, and I'll put, it, I'll put a link in the, in the question and answer to a paper that I wrote on how to do that um, and my PhD in fact was uh, was primarily on this community-based indicator measurement. Uh, it is possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything to add, Crystal? Or yes, Crystal? Can I? yes, please. So I would suggest to go through education. So we have uh, an experience with the private company in Ketapang. So we, we first, we try to ask a, what a, a primary secondary school to educate what the bitland there, because they don't know what are the bitland because they don't have the subject. And through this education, we ask them to do the camping and then we replant the trees. And then we hope that Later on, they could also monitor the tree growth and to study the, the pitland. So because we really need to change the perspective uh, on the pitlands because in other domain, because pitland is just used for planting oil palm or other uh, crops. So here we, 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 we introduce, it is important to restore the pitland and the uh, Peatland restoration should be become uh, a daily talk among uh, the communities in the in the local. So it's very uh, well in takes time, yeah. yeah. So it takes time. So yeah. you're advocating changing of behavior through awareness and communication. This so that's a very very valid point. I think Ravi touched uh, on this quite uh, uh, you know clearly in his keynote. Is Crystal, any any thoughts? You are muted, by the way. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Rupesh. I agree with with Gusti that cap capacity, but building and communication is very, very important. And I can see the difference, you know, between Indonesia and Peru. In Peru, uh, uh, policymakers, uh, uh, practitioners, students are not even aware about the, the huge amount of carbon that is stored in the in these pigments. And so it's uh, it's very important. And uh, also this video that was shown to us before with journalists uh, being um, brought to the field to learn about and afterwards to communicate about pigments is, is very important. Um, the next thing is about, uh, you know, using uh, different methods or how different methods are applied and how to combine the results. Um, of course, it's, it's always a bit tricky. And um, for instance, um, when we combine emission factors for the IPCC, um, we had to, to, to use uh, results from different methods. And I can cite the, you know, the, the, what, I, what I presented, the flux to difference approach and the subsidence also, um, which, is, which is, gives very different types of results that we had to combine. And um, we had to use uh, expert judgment um, several times to, to be able to, to combine these, these different results from different methods. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, yeah, so that was very, very good and succinct response. I'm, I'm very happy. This is a very invigorating discussion. Uh, there are a few questions that have come in uh, in our question and answer box. Uh, I was trying to monitor them, look at them. So there were initial questions for Ravi. 
Um, unfortunately, Ravi connection uh, was uh, disrupted due to heavy rain in Goa, so he could not be in the meeting. But he, we have sent these questions over email, and he will be responding those either before this the, our session runs out, and we'll post it here. But he could he not. Yes. Oh, he has already. So that that's good. So uh, now uh, for this session, there are questions which were. Um, a couple of them were directed to uh, Professor uh, Reed and to Crystal, and I think they are kind of re specific in terms of your paper and 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 uh, publications and modeling. So if you don't mind typing them in, I think that would be good. There is one interesting question. I will um, touch that, and we'll have quick uh, short discussion, and then we'll move on to session two. Uh, one question was regarding fire, so I just want to mention our next session covers fire aspects. So. Uh, please uh, stay tuned. We will be talking about fire in our next session. Uh, and the question is from a um, uh, gentleman, Abhinandan Saikia. He's asking whether uh, we need to, to discard the notion of best practices. And in place, we can um, perhaps use something like local-based local pragmatic information, keeping in mind the importance of collective wisdom and scientific rigor. Uh, vigor. So what he's, I think, saying is to blending these two aspects together, where which is also what we have been sort of uh, discussing and advocating as a part of our approaches that these criteria and indicators uh, who will be using and how we can bring together. So that is very much true. But uh, I'm not 100% sure whether I can really say whether it's better to use best practice or it's better to use local based pragmatic information. I think at the end of the day, if you think about it, pragmatic means what is in, in practice. And when if it's local based information, which is combining scientific vigor and local wisdom, then it will obviously be best practices. That is my take. But if you have any anything to add, very quick, very briefly, 30 second each. Anyone, Park Daniel or any, uh, any of our panelists. I've written a few papers about uh, how to combine local and scientific knowledge of indicators. I'll put them into the question and answer, um, but there are methods for, for doing this. Uh, the key message is that we can't romanticize uh, and accept unquestioningly all local knowledge. And equally, we should not unquestioningly accept uh, what we all think uh, is received wisdom in the academic world as well. All need to be tested and weighed um, uh, before deciding what actually will work. And you can combine the two knowledge bases as it is possible. Great, thank you. Um, any parting thoughts before we officially kind of end session one and move to session two? Before you move to session two, Rupesh, mm -hmm. can I read what uh, Ravi answered to the questions? Yes, please, that would be great. Okay, I think the gentleman who asked question to Ravi was about the communication. He is uh, Mr. Margianto. Um, what kind of communication means would be very uh, effective to do this kind of work. And Ravi responds is that based on his experience, uh, using the local language is very important. So if we have uh, scientists working in the field, make sure they can also understand at least clues about the local languages. And then um, the means can be uh, video, can be uh, uh, radio, uh, uh, sorry, or even TV. So video is, is good, especially for uh, communication with farmer to farmer type of video. So that's, that's very, very effective. And the second question is related to the principle about um, good enough is better than perfect. Um, Ravi uh, respond is about optimizing the cost that is going to be spent to do this kind of work. So adding one digital uh, decimal point in, in the numbers uh, is not that important compared with the huge amount of cost that will uh, accrue from this kind of exercise. So make sure if it is Good enough, that's fine. No need to be too perfect. That's it. Thank you, Daniel. So uh, I again thank uh, my esteemed panelist members to share their wisdom knowledge in this session. It was uh, a very informative session. 